Hello, I'm Karen Jenkins Johnson, principal of Jenkins Johnson Gallery in San Francisco and New York. Thank you for joining us. My team and I hope that you're healthy, safe, and well during these very challenging times. We welcome you to our 11th Conversation on Culture, a weekly discussion during the COVID-19 pandemic with artists, curators, and collectors on current art world topics. On this Juneteenth, the day uh, that commemorates the emancipation of slaves in America over 400 years ago, I'm thrilled to be in conversation with Troy Carter, West Philadelphia born and raised. <laughs> He's a founder and CEO of Q&A, a media and technology company. Mr. Carter served as Spotify's global head of creator services, overseeing relationships with artists, producers, songwriters, and labels. In 2017, he was named entertainment advisor to the estate of Prince Rogers Nelson. His foray into the tech world resulted in the formation of cross-culture ventures. Early stage investments include Uber, Lyft, Dropbox, Spotify, Warby Parker, The Skim, Slack, Gimlet Media, Thrive Market, and ATTN. Troy's interest in artists has expanded beyond music into the visual arts. He was recently recognized in Art News Top 200 Collectors issue as one to watch. Mr. Carter is a trustee at Los Angeles Contemporary Museum of Art, Cal Arts, and the Aspen Institute. He is a founding advisor for art and practice in Los Angeles. Troy and his wife, Rebecca, also hosts some of the best parties around. <laughs> <laughs> if lucky, you might get a private concert with some of the world's leading musicians or have a conversation with a, leading, with a living music legend or famous politician. The Carters are a beautiful family that exude human kindness. There will be a Q&A at the end of the conversation, so please send us questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please also join in the chat. Troy, I'm so excited. Welcome to Conversation and Culture. Uh, thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So let's get to it. So how long have you been around art, and how did you start collecting? You know, um, it, I've, I've been... I, th I would say, you know, uh, I work in, a, in, in the music field. So like, I think I've been, I've been around artists pretty much my in, in, entire life since I can remember. But, you know, it started off as a music artist and um, had this fascination with great songwriters, you know, um, Stevie Wonder and Lionel Richie um, and John Lennon are like just three of my favorite songwriters of all time. And then when I started getting to meet artists, you know, in the, in the visual art space, to me, from a process perspective, I saw, I saw a lot of similarities in, in between um, the, the, the process of just the whole idea around the process of creation and kind of looked at, I always looked at songwriting like as almost like a download from God and, uh, and then seeing like the process of, of visual artist work and I just started taking a, a, a real interest. And so I would say probably seriously collecting maybe about, maybe about eight to 10 years ago, I would pick up pieces here and there. And then, um, then, you know, once you start going down the rabbit hole, you know, you just really go down the rabbit hole. And then I wanted to start outside of collecting, I wanted to understand the, the dynamics of the art world mm -hmm. and the sort of relationship between artists, galleries, museums, collectors, um, auction houses, like, and just understanding how it all works. So that it became a bit of an obsession for me. Well, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, do you have a mission and philosophy behind your collecting? Um, I, I guess, you know, it, it's mostly, you know, if you look at the, the collection is mostly around um, contemporary um, African and African American artists. And, and it, ver it, 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 it veers off in certain places, you know, if yeah. I find just pieces that, that I love or may, or may speak to me, but I would say like, that's the, that's the core of it. And, and, and the philosophy, like, the philosophy for me is 
I, I don't buy stuff that I don't actually hang. And so between my office and, and, and house and, di and different spaces that I'm actually in, yes. pretty much everything is always up and just kind of rotates or whatever. And then it may end up in friends' houses or relative houses and things along those lines. But I, I, I really believe in collecting what you, what you love. Yeah, right. And um, do you think that, do you uh, collect, is it instinctive, emotional, or, or analytical? Um, it is very instinctive. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and then that instinctive, of course, you know, ties emotion into it. And, um, and not really as analytical as I am in other areas of my life, you okay. know, with, 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 our, with our business. But um, but a, a lot of it is I I'll, I'm pa I'm very patient. Okay. So even if it's an artist that I want to collect and is not the right piece for me, I'll politely pass and wait. And even if I know I might even be waiting for a, a much longer time, yes. I won't buy it if I don't feel like it's is is the right is the right piece. And then um, and then I've never worked with um, any sort of art consultants or whatever. So for me, it's like really about work that I feel like it is, it, it has some sort of connection or meaning to me. Okay. All right. So, you know, while you're um, um, speaking, Michael, could you bring up a couple of works in Troy's collection, please? Um, let's just look at a couple of, of works that you, you have. And um, let's talk about, uh, let's, let's, uh, you want to talk about, Nathaniel Mary Quinn, or who would you like to speak about first? Yeah, I, I, I love Nathaniel. And, um, and he's been an artist that I've wanted to collect for a long time. And um, Swiss Beats was probably the first person that told me about Nathaniel. And so I followed him and, you know, just following his work. And uh, Annie from The Hammer asked if I would be interested in interviewing um, Nathaniel for um a, a series that they were doing at the hammer museum the week that he was opening up his show in la and which it was an ama amazing experience because you know anybody that knows him just knows he goes a hundred levels deep and like you know just pro probably one of the smartest soulful guys i've I i've met and um and but when i went into b before the interview um, I went to the show right after they set it up at Gagosian, and um, and Ashley, who works with Nathaniel, um, showed me this piece, and I just I fell in love with it, and I just thought I I, I had to have it, and just you know um, how how come not me, you know just with the the title, you know you can't really see the details in this piece, but it's like just the, 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 the gold leaflets, that the, is a level of complexity and, and, and the actual piece that, that's great. And a lot of people who look at Nathaniel's work think it's collage work. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, but it, 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 but it, and it's so intricate. But him explaining like, how come not me? And around when him, you know, he, he, he lost his mom at, at, at a young age. He's at this boarding school with, you know, that, he really, that was foreign to him, you know, just with a bunch of well-off families and just kind of looking at life through the lens of, of what other people have essentially and, 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 and the lack and, you know, and, and not having, um, you know, his, his, his mom any, any, anymore, you know, in, in, in his life. And, um, and it just spoke to me because growing up without my dad and, and, you know, all of these things. That, so it just was like an instant connection with, with both Nathaniel and this particular piece. Well, I thank you for explaining it's not collage because it's, you know, black charcoal gouache and soft pastel oil pastel on, on um, paper. Um, is there, um, did you place this? in LA or is it with you out in Massachusetts? Or? Oh, it's, it's, it's in LA and it's, um, it's actually, uh, and it's, it's in our, in our, um, it's in our, we have a TV room with a bar and it's, and it's at my bar. Okay. So he, right. he, hang, he hangs out with me. Okay. All right. That's <laughs> wonderful. That's what's fun when you're collecting, determining where 
placement of the work as well. Do you, do you, um, you know, what's it like being a, a black man collecting art? You know, it's, um, it, I learned a lot in the beginning about um, just dealing with, just dealing with certain galleries and, and especially before, um, you know, people didn't know who I was and, you know, and, and, you know, so you have that one level of, you know, protection and wanting to make sure that the artist pieces are going in the right places. Um, but, you know, I felt a, a high level of discrimination in, in the beginning and, you know, just where some of the comments that would be made by certain shows that I would go to and artists that I would ask about. And, um, and when I met the artists that were represented by some of, some of the galleries, it's like they had a complete opposite in terms of like just being completely down to earth. And a lot of the artists that I collect are, you know, within my, within my generation of, of, of age. Okay. And if they're not within my generation of age, we is similar background in certain, you know, certain circumstances a lot of times. So when I, when, when we start talking, it's like, you get that connection, you know? And um, so that part for me was a little disheartening. And, but Pam Joyner, you know, who a, a lot of people know on here probably know, and is an excellent collector, Pam taught me, she's like, Troy, you gotta fight for the best pieces of work. Don't let people just give you anything. Don't just fall for the okie doke. You know, if you got to call artists and, 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 and tell them what you understand about, you know, their practices, and, but don't just go for basically what anybody's just telling you or, or, or the piece that you may not want. And Pam taught me that. And I took it to heart. And it's like, if, it, if it's a piece that I fall in love with, mm -hmm. um, I'm fighting for the piece. And do you find that you get it? Not all the time, okay. But um, but I, I I'm I, it's hard for me to take no for an answer sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'll keep I'll keep going. And um, but it's it's you know sometimes you just know when something is 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 meant to be. Yeah. And you just know that like you know what it's this 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 artist and this piece just speaks to me in a way that mm -hmm. that. I, I would be, I would, I would kick myself if I, if I left home, if I left without this. And, and do you have galleries that support you in your collecting or there's galleries you still got to give the boot to? It's still, it's still galleries that you got to give the boots. You know what is, this is what it is. It's, you got galleries who will support you with certain artists. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you get you could get general support um, because they know that you're gonna be you're you're a credible collector that you're not gonna be flipping the work or any or anything like that that you appreciate the 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 artist. But then when it comes to certain artists, it may just be a much harder artist to get from that particular that particular gallery. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That brings to mind. Uh, Michael, I want you to bring up uh, Rashid Johnson. Um, he's going to bring up uh, the painting of Rashid's that you have in your collection. Could you tell us a little bit about um, how you how you acquired this piece? Yeah, so so um, Rashid is an artist who I who I absolutely love and respect, and um, I had one of the. Um, the, the anxious men in my in my house that I that I had gotten that I that I, I love and I was in funny enough with this one I was in Aspen for Aspen Institute board meeting and when I when I landed I saw that the Aspen Museum was having a, a, a gala that night so I skipped the board dinner that night and went to the museum and literally bought one ticket and. They gave me the worst table, like by the kitchen or whatever. So you got servers going by, like hitting you in the head. And, uh, and Annie from the Hammer saw me there. And I was at a table with people I didn't know. And she uh -huh. said, come sit with us. And she grabs a, a, a chair 
took a, a setting from a, another table and oh, squeezed right. me in with the hammer team. And when this one, Rashid was getting honored. And when this came up for auction that night, when they were honoring them, um, that, that was when I said, I'm just, I fell in love with it. And Rash, Rashid originally gave the museum a smaller piece for the oh, auction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, the museum told Rashid, they said, well, look, you know, usually, you know, artists who do the, who we honor each year usually give us, you know, a, a big, you know, pieces that we really can raise money for or whatever. Yeah, right. And Rashid took this one out of his personal collection. And we, I, I, I went, I went nuts bidding on this one that night. So we just, it was me and somebody else across the room and we just went at it. And I'm like, I am, um, Hey, I'm going home with this. You're going home with him. I'm going home. <laughs> I'm going home. And, Ra and Rashid is like, and I, that, that night was my first time meeting him too, by the way. Yeah, he's a really smart guy. He is smart. He's a lot of uh, trailblazing, a lot of roads for, uh, in the art world and different, different avenues. Um, so can you, Michael, can you take that down, please? So can you tell us- And, and, and that particular piece, what I loved about it though, yeah. was that it's, it's almost like every, everything that I love about Rashid yes. is in that particular piece. And, and like the, 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 the ceramic, like it, it's just, it's so, it's so detailed and, um, but, and I know, and you, if, if you ever see it, you can see why it's, it's one, you, you've seen it. Yeah. You can see why it's one of his favorite pieces. Well, it's, it's in your living room. Yes. Yeah. And it, it really sets the tone when you walk in your house. Um, immediately to your left, you walk in and that beautiful painting is there, these sliding doors. And it's just, it sets the mood. It also brings a calm to the, to the house as well. It, 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 the, 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 it does. It does. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely good. So how is your collection evolving now that you were able to bid and, and you know, pretty much let people know your purchasing power and what you're able to do and you're going to go toe to toe with people if you want to, if you really want to work. How, 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 is, how is your collection evol evolving over the last few years? Um, you know, I, I would say I, I've been going um, a, a it's, it's funny, kind of going sort of both ways, but where one, one of the things um, that Thelma Golden told me was that I was asking her just about like, you know, what, as black collectors sort of, you know, what, what should we be doing as black collectors to, you know, to, to help artists. And when she was very candid in saying that we, we don't get there early enough. So you, you have other collectors that go in and they're supporting those artists really early in their, in their, in their practices. And, um, and that was a aha moment for me because so, in store, in, so instead of waiting for somebody to get a buzz, you know, where can I be most helpful? And, you know, with some artists, you know, since that conversation, um, you know, some artists will see some of the work, you know, and they'll be almost pre-gallery sometimes, and we'll just go really deep, and we'll go in and buy quite a few pieces from them, just so they, where, where they can go in, with, with, and especially right now over the last few months, where people could go in with a certain level of confidence of, my 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 show is sold out. I have um, a good group of collectors who who actually bought it, and this can sort of it can help with my story. Um, it can help you know me pay the bills and all of those things or whatever. And um, so on on that level, been you know really working with artists there, and then also just going going beyond just a practice yes. so where you know the one thing with like mark bradford and and theaster what i liked about what they were doing was to work outside of the studio and and in the community 
So, you know, like I said, I'm on the board of art and practice. The Aster and I have worked on, you know, quite a few things together. And, you know, last week I'm, you know, in Watts with Lauren Halsey, you know, um, in the, in the, in the, in the projects. And, and so we like where that to me, it speaks to me alongside of it, you know yeah. what I'm So it, it yeah. actually gives the work yes. a way different, you know, meaning as, yeah, as, as well. Yes. And, um, do you find that, um, meeting the meeting the artist is just another way to solidify uh brings brings the art piece full circle um and does that does that help you to um to meet other artists uh as well um yeah it's it's, it's such a small world it's it's funny because um like uh are you are you familiar with um jeremy o'harris and slave play no. So Slave Play, it, it probably, if the Tonys were going live this year, this probably would have won the Tony. But we invested in a Broadway show um, called Slave Play that's probably one of the most critically acclaimed shows. And it came about through these cold emails that I was getting from um, th this, this agent. And finally, I answered. And I'm like, who, you know, who is this guy? Yeah. And after we invested, I'm at dinner with, open at night, I'm at dinner with this playwright and he's telling me the story of, he's like, Rashid Johnson told me that I should email you and that you should be the guy who should produce this play. And I never knew that. I never knew that. And that came directly through, you know, through building that relationship with Rashid. And it's like, so, from you know whether it's you know I've I met artists through the Aster I met artists through uh, Mark I met art, like it's it's just kind of this thing that kind of one person will put you on to the next yes 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 so uh, there's a question here from Larry I'm just gonna put in here because I think this is a good good spot. Larry Osei Mensa yeah Larry Osei Mensa hey Larry. Larry puts um, me on to everybody. <laughs> yeah. So besides fighting for the best work, how much would you, would you suggest that young collectors push past the discrimination they might be confronted with in order not to be discouraged from being part of the conversation as a collector? So I, think young you got, I think you got to call it out when you see it, for sure. Okay. Yes. And then I think it's important to let the artist know your experience with the gallery. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's, I think that's very, I think it's very important. And, um, you know, because, and, and especially when you're, when, you, when certain, one, you got to understand the, the, as a collector, you got to understand that there's a rule, there's rules and there's a hierarchy. And I respect that, by the way. So, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, there's certain pieces where it's like, you know what? Certain people have been collecting as artists for however long. They've been there from the very beginning. They've um, they they've supported this artist in other ways. They supported this gallery in, in in other ways. So you and and it's a limited number of pieces, right? Right. So that's you 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 only can respect that. Right. So um, for me, it's more when you've supported that artist and you've been there for a long time and you still get that. Yes. And that's, that's, that's the part that doesn't sit, sit well with me. The yes. other piece, though, is for that collector to invest in that relationship with the gallery yes. by, you know, just showing up, showing up to their events, meeting other people, meeting people through, through, throughout that gallery, going on studio visits for the artists that you like and artists that you, that you can learn about. And then, um, so it's, so it's ways that you sort of invest in those, in those relationships and that, and you sort of, and you start building that trust. Yes. Um, and you're very clear with the, the gallerist, your price points and your budget. So when something does come up, yes, that it's within something within your range. And so you're ready to accept that, you know, opening, opening that door because it's a two way street. You have to let the gallerist or consultant know. Uh, what exactly you're looking for and uh, the trajectory of what you're trying to do with your collecting 
Yes. And let them know that you're just starting out um, because everybody has different purchasing power. Mm -hmm. I mean, for people of color, this is just my opinion, for people of color, we don't have generational wealth. Right. So we don't have grandparents who've had this, that, and the other on their wall. We don't have those old relationships that open doors. So we have to open those doors ourselves. And part of it, Troy, like you said, is forming those relationships and letting people know who you are, that you're there to support the gallery, you're there to support the artist. And if the gallery's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, it's up to the artist to inform the artist and the artist step into the light and let them know because we have to collect our own people. If we don't collect our own people, it's a shame. Because as you know right now, this is the, you know, artists of the diaspora undervalued. Yes. Yes. Totally and, 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 and then we, you know, it's, and, and just speaking for myself and just like, I have a bunch of friends who probably started collecting around the time I started or, 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 or after. Um, coming from hip hop culture, I valued a car more than I valued art. And because me coming up and seeing certain things and images of what it meant to be rich as a black person, it's like you're seeing music videos and you're seeing, you know, these sort of, uh, uh, of things. So my first purchase when I first made money was, uh, you know, I bought a car and it was like, you know, and so it's, and the car probably was more valuable than my house that I've still lived in in West Philly at, the, at, the, at that time. So it's like, it, so, so art itself wasn't high on the list. Um, and for a lot of people I know who, who have, you know, first generational wealth, you go into their houses and their walls are still empty and, you know, things along those lines. So, and, so it, and, and if, it, if the work's not explained or there is not the proper introduction, you either are condescending about contemporary art or, um, or you might feel intimidated by, by, by the actual environment. So I think it's kind of, is that, is that education process and that form boarding that feels comfortable where you're not embarrassed to, to open up to the gallery to say, hey, I don't know about this. I don't want to, you, cause you're going to go pretend, you know, or not ask questions um, or not embarrassed about a smaller entry point because you're not ready to make that big investment yet. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's true. And so, um, you know, it's, um, it's often important just to be very, very truthful with, with, uh, with the gallerist and people you're, you're collecting because otherwise you can get yourself in trouble. So just just be truthful and let it let let it. Um, uh, um, I think that's the most important thing you can do when you're trying to break into collecting and be truthful with yourself and also get to know the marketplace and where you fit in and, and put together a strategy. So that's that's one of the things um, I wanted to ask you. When did it come? When was there a time when you thought what you were doing went from collecting um, to collection, to a collection. The, the funny thing is, I didn't know I was a collector until somebody introduced me to somebody's a collector. So, <laughs> 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 so I, 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 I didn't even consider myself a collector. I was like, wow, I'm, okay, I'm a collector now, yes. So I didn't even really consider myself a collector until somebody introduced me uh, as, as one. And even now, I kind of feel funny that I feel like I, 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 I cause I, I, I know, I know collectors who collect for value, for, for financial value. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, the, the actual work itself and the artist itself, it, it, it supersedes the financial value for me. So, okay. I, so sometimes when I hear collector, it even makes me cringe a little bit because I'm like, 
I'm more on the artist side, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, yeah. So it's like, I, so, so that part for me still feel, feels a bit funny. And then the, from a collection standpoint, it's, that's where it gets a little overwhelming for me, to be honest with you, because being able to, because I don't have um, an art advisor, and because I don't have a team that manages it for me or any or anything like that or whatever, and you know me, I call you, me and you deal with each other directly, or, or you yes. know, and everything else or whatever. Um, so being able to sort of manage it and think about it thoughtfully to make sure it's um, that that it feel that everything feels intentional and connected to each other because it's, cer it's certain pieces in the collection where I'm like, hmm, if I had to do that one all over again, I, I, I wouldn't do that. It would probably be different. Um, you know, maybe I need to prune here and, and go here. Like, so that's the part that, I, that I've, I've been learning. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes, you know, in any, any type of collecting or any type of decision making, you don't always you know, you look at something, what was I thinking when I bought that? But yes. at the moment you thought it was a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 I think this is a, a, a good time to bring up um, this artist that I absolutely uh, love. Um, uh, Michael, can you bring up Lynette's image? Now this is a painter toy that I have been trying to get for years. And you know, the galleries aren't calling me back. And um, I saw this pig and I said, whoa, it is so stunning and so the beautiful. Eyes. <laughs> <laughs> the eyes. Yeah, yeah that, 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 the eyes on that one. Um, uh, Arthur Lewis introduced me to, um, to Joanna over at um, Jack Shaman. This is like freeze a couple years back. Uh, and one, I just hit it off with her and just loved her. She, you know, just amazing. And I would always ask about Lynette. <laughs> and I remember it was, an, it was another Lynette piece that Swiss Beats told me about. He said, Troy, Sylvia Rohn has this Lynette piece on hold right now that if she doesn't get it, you better get it. And, uh, and of course, Sylvia got it. And that was like the, uh, and I love that piece. So I waited and waited and waited, and then um, and then this one became available, and um, and I got it. And then, actually, this is in that same room that that the Nathaniel Mary Quinn is in. Okay. But it's just one of those where you you know it is 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 warm, and yeah. it, and you know and like I said, I was just drawn into the eyes, you know, from from the moment I saw it. And you know, she's and she's just such an amazing. She's just one of the best painters of of, of her time. Yeah, maybe you can hook me up too. <laughs> I want another one. <laughs> well, as soon as you get your other one, you put me in there. <laughs> uh, well, I think that's wonderful because I, I, uh, Joanna has helped a lot of people, and I think it's important to also. You miss you mentioned Swiss. Um, how has your relationship with Swiss Beach helped with your art collecting? Oh, it's inc incredible! You know, Swiss. Swiss. I've known since he was seventeen years old. And so um, Eve, Eve was the first artist that I've ever managed and Swiss was the producer on that album. So I've known him since he was a kid and i never forget Swiss invited me up to his house. He lived somewhere far up north in New York and uh, it was so far and up in the hills that the airplane lights oh uh, were God. on the house, like the red and blue oh blinking lights. So, yeah. so um, like, so so far okay. and um and when i went in he was showing me all these paintings and telling me about art and it was so foreign to me at the time like it just like no nothing really clicked but he was a guy as i started collecting i would call him constantly and send him pictures and up until two weeks ago i still sent <laughs> i still sent stuff to swiss and um and he's just he he you know Swiss is good taste, um he's he's like a secondary gut check for me a lot a lot okay. of times. Okay. And and you know he's 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 like my he's a, a a brother to me. Oh wonderful, 
that's great to have somebody that close to that because this the artwork that you're acquiring is at a certain um, level um, that um, some collectors can achieve that purchase at that level but you're able to and it's wonderful to have your a friend like Swiss to to um, be in conversation with an advice an advisor because some people have their own agendas but to have a friend that's really looking out for your interest I think is so important for people to find that when they're collecting in the art world no, definitely and, and he's generous with his information and it's like that's the one thing that I found just amongst um, other black collectors where it's like people have been so generous in terms of introduction sharing relationships information you know their own experiences you know so it's you know that that's the part you know in in, in la is such a small community and um and I, I just i just love being part of part of that community oh that's um i think you're blessed very blessed so i i want to just um shift gears here a little bit and uh, I want to talk about your business end of the arts and um, your position on boards. I think that, you know, you're a trustee on various in, uh, institutional boards, including Lockmont, Cal Arts, and Aspen Institute. Um, so you're a black man with a seat at the table, the table of power. What does that mean and how are you affecting change? You know, I, I think this, the last few weeks have been very telling. Very, 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 very telling. And we got a long way to go as a people. Yes. <laughs> and a long way to go as institutions. And when you think about how institutions were, were, were built because a lot of people will preach about change and talk change. Yes. And you might think people are the most progressive liberals that you that, that you've ever met and the other side are the bad guys, but people don't people, you know, it, it's when, when, when it hits the fan, you know, you, you get this, you get to see things for what they really are. So, you know, of course, I've had to find myself explaining what Black Lives Matter really means. And being able to tell people, not my experiences of how I grew up, but my experiences of five and a half months ago, going on my YPO retreat and me and my nine forum, forum for my nine forum uh, mates get out of the SUVs. We go in the trunks to get our bags to go to, in a hotel, and I get attacked by security. Yes. Everybody else got their bags fine. I get literally physically grabbed, and 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 that was the, that was my forum's first time seeing what racism actually look like an action with someone that they know you know what i'm saying this isn't watching you're not riding by seeing a guy sitting on the curb with the cops right. he might be guilty right you know what i'm saying like you think it's bias right or or right. whatever else but this was their first time seeing it and I'm explaining that to board members and people I'm affiliated with. And because this lives with me every day. And when this blows over and this isn't the topic of, of, of the month anymore, I'm still a black man living, living in America that's going to be discriminated against. My kids are still going to be judged as black kids. I still got three black boys and two black girls. You know, and I still got black family members that live in, 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 in the hood in Philly. Like, it is, it, my, my, my life is deeply connected to what we see happening in, in, the, in the streets. And these institutions got to step up. Oh, absolutely. Talk about collecting black artists and not invest in black communities. Period. Yeah. Period. You got you to gotta really walk the walk. You got to really walk the walk. It shouldn't be a debate in boardrooms 
with the press releases should be or whether or not we feel right saying that Black Lives Matter. They do or they don't to you. Right. They, they either do or they don't. It's not saying that other lives don't matter. It's not saying, but, but if you can't be honest as an institution where, where you are, that impacts a lot of things because there's a lot of people within these institutions and on the board of these institutions that make decisions every single day that affect people of color. So how are you getting them to shift? I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to be very candid and, and, and I won't even mention, I won't even mention the board or anything like that, but I had a conversation that pissed, it was, it, I, I resigned from, from, from a board and then, cause I, cause I was that disgruntled and I changed my mind because I'm like, I'm the only, you only can fix this stuff from the inside out. That's right. You only can fix it from the inside out. out. And if I'm not in here fighting and if I'm not in here making a stink, and if I'm not in here being able to say where, where certain funds are going to be deployed, and then, and then sometimes I, it is cert, certain times it's people who genuinely may have the best intent yeah. that might need to hear an opposing point of view that pulls them in a, in, in a, dif, in a different direction. So, so it, it is not, it's not easy by any means, Karen, and it's frustrating. Yes. And somebody told me the other day, we were working on this voter initiative and, um, and, and, uh, and this one white guy, um, and you know, all, everybody is five of us working on it. And you know, everybody is, is four, four black guys, very influential, one white guy. And the one white guy says, hey, I want to pull in this manager and this manager because, uh, you know, I, I'm the only white guy on the board. I said, you know how many times we're the only black guys in the room? I said, get fucking comfortable. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I'm like, <laughs> get, com get, 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 com get comfortable. Because this is what we got to deal with every single every day, day. Of, of, of having to work through this discomfort. Yeah. So, we're, you know, we're fighting a good fight. I think we're at a very... And we're at an important inflection point in our in our country, yes. and um, and we got we got to make this a tipping point. We have to make it a tipping point, but I'm I'm so glad that you changed your mind on that board. If I heard you right, you changed mm -hmm. your mind. I changed my mind. Right. Yep. Right, because if, if, if Troy, if you're not there, people are not going to see it through your lens. And we're dealing with systemic racism. People don't oftentimes understand the behavior that they're doing that it about it's impacting others in a negative way or excluding others. And unless somebody like yourself uh, are there, um, then they're going to continue on with the same old good old boy network. And the um, the museums in this country need to be called on it. They need to be called on it. And the only way they're going to listen is if, unfortunately. If a black person of, with means and of power speaks it to them. And so I encourage you to con look to please be on more boards because <laughs> <laughs> this is rampant throughout the art world. I, and I'm, I'm sure you and everybody within this talk can relate. It's been, the last few weeks have been exhausting. Yes. It's, been ex it's, been, it's been exhausting. And having to because you know at one point i wanted to take the position of i shouldn't have to explain and but sometimes you gotta ex you gotta explain and it it it, it 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 is exhausting but the reality is when you look at what the people who fought for us who, who put their bodies on the line and put their lives on the line and had to, had to, you know, drive through the South and march through the South and hose down, bitten by a dog. That's exhausting. 
You know what I'm saying? So me having to, you know, it, it, it explain this, you know, is, is no, nowhere near the work that was put in to get me here. So um, let's talk about the business culture in American museums today as well. What can we do, those of us that may not have the purchasing power that you have, what can we do in addressing the business culture or the, the culture in our institutions in our areas? Uh, in, in, in which way? Um, you know, for example, we're here in San Francisco and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art has been called out on uh, their, their culture of exclusion, exclusion employees, um, exclusion of acquisitions, lowering uh, uh, some artists from the high level exhibitions to the low level. Um, how, how could we go in um, if we don't have a seat at the table? How can we have these conversations with these institutions? Is there, is there a level that we can go into to affect these change? I mean, you're, you're a trustee, but everybody can't be a trustee. I, I, I think, the, I think the, the, the collective of the people becomes even more powerful than, than, than the trustees and, um, and, and directors, you know, because I, because I do think, um, you know, going back to people, you know, it, it's almost like the, is, is there, there aren't a lot of mavericks that 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 are in those leadership positions that will take chances and push up against the grain and 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 do things outside the norm or, or um, do things that the trustees who are writing the biggest checks may not like, you know, because it is even a hierarchy within the trustee system as, as well. So you know, you got certain people who can write checks as long as, te you know, as, as Texas, essentially. Right. So that generational wealth that, 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 that we're talking about. So it, it, it's, the, but the people actually speak a lot louder and the artists actually speak a lot louder as, as well. So how do, how do you make that collective come, come together to, to, a, a, as one voice? Yes. You know what I'm saying? Because it's much harder if, it, if it's just an independent voice. Okay. So gather a group of people together as a collective. Well, yeah, because yeah, you, you see, you know, I, you know I, I'm, not, I'm not all in on like the whole um, cancel culture thing, um, but you, you see in these cases where they'll go after, you, you've seen artists get trustees removed from boards because of their business practices. Or, 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 or their investment affiliations and things along those lines and trust and or, or because of their families being in big pharma. Like, so you're seeing like this, this, it, it, it actually works. So um, it, it's just a matter of the collective. Right, right. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, you've had ups and downs, ups and downs and way downs and way highs. So you've been through quite a quite a bit in your life, and um, uh, events that you know would cause somebody to throw their hands up in the air and say, "I give up." Um, what would you say to artists and people in the in the art world who are currently down financially right now? Um, you know, I, I think you know just based off of my my own experience, you know, I've, you know, it's um, that's just the path to success, right? Just in terms of Yes. You know, it, it kind of looking like that. Right. And, um, and a lot of times, like what I learned and I'll get specifically to that, that, to that answer. But like what I learned is when you look back on some of your greatest successes or greatest failures, it's, and you really take up to really take a look for me, my success was not actually things that I could have predicted. Meeting certain people, being a certain place at a certain time, like where I, you know, I, where I've, I've, I had dreams and aspirations of doing certain things, but I couldn't, have, I couldn't have said Eve is gonna hire me as her manager 
and you know when she hired me i couldn't have said um i was going to sell this company when i sold it or meet this entrepreneur that was going to allow me to invest you can't plan for certain things right it's, it becomes serendipitous um and and with failure when i look back on that on failure what i i always it, when you're in it it's the worst possible feeling Yes. but you can't allow yourself to drown in it right but Be right. because if you start if you allow yourself to drown in it that's when it becomes this perpetual cycle so it's it, it's this exercise of being able to feed yourself with as much positive information positive affirmation like I, this is very very practical but like i would have a list of of, of bills that like my 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 accounts receivables yes. that at, at that time I knew I couldn't even pay, yes. but it was like if a little something came in and I was able to pay that forty seven eighty five you know I checked that off check and that off call that person and say hey I, you know I, I I sent that but I wasn't gonna sit there and look at that list all day long because you get you drown in that or whatever so can I spend that same time that I would be looking at that kind of looking at what kind of opportunities can I make for myself? Where do, where does the, it's no different than what they're going through right now. Yes. The music industry on a macro level is going through. So we're looking at the music industry as, okay, live touring is screwed until the end of next year. But where can we find opportunities at right now? Where can we get ahead of everybody at right now? That's the magic question. That's a magic question. That's, I think that's great. So I hope, um, I, I, that brings me to another thing of yours. There's a book that you love called Who Moved the Cheese? How has that impacted your life? <laughs> 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 that, that book is like, um, it, just, it just talks about change. Yes. And, um, and, and, you know, it's a short book, like I, you can read it within like an hour or two, but it's just like, it, it, it basically talks about who are you going to be when, 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 it, when it's, when things starts to change, because change is, in, is, is inevitable. And so it's, it's going to sound super silly. But I was on an airplane flying to Europe one time and like, you know, you run out of movies to watch. And it was this move, it was a documentary on like uh, beavers and like a nature documentary. And it showed this beaver who like the first year of its life in the winter, it almost died. And um, because it, it wasn't prepared. And mm -hmm. then, you know, they followed it, you know, through that next season. And when it was, when it was warm, you saw that beaver starting to build out for the winter. And I'm like, this is the best life lesson. When things are good, this is when you start preparing. Like this, this is when you prepare for the downswing yes. because downswings are always inevitable and unpredictable. Nobody could have predicted COVID. Right. You know what I'm saying? So well, well, they did, but anyway. <laughs> but but not I don't I don't think the impact of the timing and how fast that when you got to be out of your office in two weeks and shut your entire business down, it's like, okay, are you prepared for it? The, the, what, what I learned from that, from that documentary is when things are incredible and going incredibly well, that's when you start planning for it. But not, 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 the self-fulfilling prophecy of, okay, this is all going to be a disaster, but you better be prepared because if there's a downswing, that's when people get exposed. That's right. That's right. So thank you for that. I think, I think that's a, a great thing to, for life in general, to remember, remember that. So how do- And talk to each other about, about money. Yes. Because this, this, the same way you were saying about being honest with galleries, I think the, the thing for me was getting beyond my, beyond my own pride yes. and being able to 
ask questions from people and be vulnerable and mm -hmm. actually talk openly. And what I and, and and once I was able to do that and hear about other people's experiences of financial issues and like people like it was surprising to me. Like it's almost when I started talking to people about uh, depression and anxiety and things like that. All of a sudden, you think, well, hold on, other people go through this or whatever. It's like being open with it. You learn a lot and 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 talking to people about money was so helpful because I think being able to learn about that was, was good. Absolutely. And pride, um, we have to just let in the ego, we have to drop it, let it yep. go, let yep. it go. Yep. So how do the music tech and art world, how, how do they intersect? Um, I, w I would say, you know, it, it's, systems in place of gatekeepers and like you know decision makers and people who who sort of can decide uh almost like where you can almost pick winners and losers a lot of times right mm -hmm. so i think from structures i think there's a lot of similarities in terms of, of structures i do think the artists and music have a lot more control and um than artists and within within this space okay and i think there's i i, I think there's too many structures that are in, that are in place that no longer make sense that ha haven't evolved and in the music industry, like piracy is what forced it on the music industry. And, and it didn't have a choice but to evolve because of, because of piracy. Um, but, but in the art space, there's structures in place and things that are in place that I feel like could be disrupted. Mm, okay, we have to talk about that privately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, I'm going to um, I'm going to open it up to some Q and A here, and I'm just going to uh, Khalil uh, Robert Irving. I believe you have some of his your collection. Yes. yes. So yeah, so he's asking, when was the first time that you loaned a work to a museum for an exhibition? First time was I think the Ernie Barnes exhibition and uh, at CAM. Yep, that I think that was yeah, that was the first time. And, and what piece did you own? That was the Harlem Harlem Ballet piece. Okay. Yep. Okay. And I th think we may have answered this a little bit. How does your background in tech inform your art collecting? Um, I don't know if it does. I you know, I, I think the I think the relationship piece because in, in tech um and investing relationships are very important mm -hmm. and um and and also delivering delivering on your word is very important so you know where and it's the same thing in terms of entrepreneurs recommending you to other entrepreneurs the same way artists would recommend you to to, to other artists so um so showing up i would say would probably be the the biggest similarity okay all right and, and the relationships yes form because yeah. artists all artists want you know people want to build those relationships yeah. um and then there's a gentleman uh jamil mohammed as both a black entrepreneur engaging in commercial design and production and an emerging artist exploring fine art practices i'm sometimes concerned that I will be perceived as both a less serious entrepreneur and a less serious artist because of my involvement with both domains. Can you advise on how to navigate this? I, I just would say don't 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 let anybody define you, and um and that's a like that's a big thing for me, and it's probably the reason why I moved you know through like you know it's for uh, music, technology. Um, uh, other businesses like for, for, for me it's like 
not being, I never wanted to be boxed in as a, as, as a manager. Like, yeah. you know, it's like for, for, for me, and, and I never wanted to be defined by an artist that I, that I represent either. Like, uh, so, so for me, it was, how do I not let people define me? How do I not let, um, and, and, and so I, so I think it's up to, I think it's up to him basically mm -hmm. of, of, and, and if you're great at both, by the way, then you become, un, you become undeniable. Like, you know, so it's, so if you're great at, and, and a lot of artists are great entrepreneurs, by the way. Right. Yes. Like really, really great, mm -hmm. really great. Rashid. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there's a uh, Roger Tucker, the third, uh, cultural boards in our communities need more black people on those boards and leading those boards. They're looking for influential black people to join them. Do you belong to small cultural boards in the community? Um, art, art and practice is probably the, the, the one now. Mm -hmm. And then I've done um, quite a few in the past. And then and, and I'll, do, I'll do advisory, like um, the, the board commitments are, are, are just, a, is a, you invest a lot of time. So, um, but it, there's organizations that I advise and talk to, but it's, um, I, 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 it's hard to do a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, then Cameron Robinson, how do you find artists take invert control over the system? Similar to how we're seeing musicians go fully independent. How do fine artists take invert control over the system? Like, like, like Taylor Swift, uh, you know, leaving her label it's so the best comparison that i would make on the music side is probably beyonce beyonce and reason being beyonce redefined success for herself so for her it became less about i need a record on the radio than it is i want to do art exactly the way i want to do it and I want to put it out the way I want to put it out. So her, her manager, uh, her, her COO, Steve, is a brilliant guy. And what they've done is, you know, they'll do Lemonade with HBO. They'll do the Coachella special with Netflix. They'll do, they have all of these different ways of distribution. And um, Beyonce owns everything, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it, it's, it's artists starting to redefine what success means to them. And that being a choice, because if, if, the, if, if it continues to be, this gallery has to represent me, this museum has to, you know, uh, this has to have my work, this collector has to um, have me in their collection, then you become part of exactly what the, what the system is. But then you'll find people, you know, let's talk Chance the Rapper, right? Yes. Where Chance is a guy who is completely independent, sells his merchandise directly to fans, bypasses you know the an entire system, and so so comparing that to a to to a visual a fine artist, the fine artist may say, you know what? If a museum collects me, does that make that painting that I did better in the museum? Is it still the same painting? Is it still the same painting because this curator looks at it different than this person who loved it from the very beginning? Like, you know, so I think it's just defining what success looks like for you. And, and Instagram was the beginning of the canary in the coal mine. And I think we're going to start seeing so many cracks in the system yes. happen yeah. that I, I think this, I think the art market and the art, just the art business in general will yeah. look a, t a lot different over the next decade. Interesting. So um, Javier Tovias asks, what is your advice for an artist trying to build their own startup within the intersection of art and tech? just you you just have to do the work and um you know tech tech is it, tech is hard in terms of building a, a sustainable software company 
Mm -hmm. And for me on the entrepreneur side, it's like, you have to go, you have to go so hard and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of work. So I just would say, understand what you're getting into a, ahead of time and look at com uh, comparable companies and, and really understand what it took to make those companies successful and, and really ask yourself, are you prepared for that, for that level of, of effort alongside of the effort of work of, of building your practice at the, sa at the same exact time? I mean, one of the things I think people need to understand about you, Troy, is that you roll up your sleeves, you hit the pavement, if there's a company you're investing in, you go out and you meet the buyers, you meet the, the consumers, and you look at the, the product, all, all 360, all components impacting that. And so this is not easy. You're a successful businessman because you, you've worked really hard at it. And it's not something that just is given to you. And I think um, people really need today um, to understand that we still have to work hard for everything that we do. Uh, and it's a, I just got off with, a, with, with an entrepreneur and, um, and, and right before I got on this, I, I was on a, uh, doing a talk, uh, call with an entrepreneur and I was, I was just super honest with the entrepreneur about the, I, I, and I said, you're, you're overconfident. And when I started investing and I decided to, to, to invest, there's a guy named Bill Maris, who's the founder of Google Ventures. I spent three days in Bill Maris's office with a yellow notepad, taking notes in Menlo Park for three days. And he, he told me how bad my ideas were. He told me, like he was showing me decks of other you know, um, funds that they had invested in. And, and, and then I went to another guy, Ron Conway, who's probably one of the best angel investors of all time, and sat at Ron's apartment for two hours in San Francisco with the same yellow notepads, writing notes. Just because I was successful as a music manager didn't mean I could go in and think I could take that level of expertise as a talent manager into being a, a, a technology investor. So that's when you got to go in with humility. You got to be able to ask questions and not be embarrassed when people call your ideas dumb. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and the people who fail the most are the people who feel like they know it all. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, and I, I ask a million questions I, and I, the way I process information, like where I, I, I dropped, I dropped out in 11th grade, in 11th grade mm -hmm. and got a GD. And, and the, so when I'm asking people questions, I ask, I ask on a very, very basic level. And because I want a very clear understanding. So, so, and it's just, a, it's the way I, I, I process information, right. but once I got it, I got it. Right, right. But I can't be afraid to say, I have no idea what you're fucking talking about right now. Right. What, is it, what does that mean? Exactly, exactly. That's, that's wonderful. I'm just going to ask a quick questions here. There's two questions here that we're going to, uh, so, so one question, Britt Sal Salveson says, uh, do you always have to buy work in real life uh, before, or you have to see it, or do you uh, buy online, like on Instagram? Um, I don't have to see it in real life. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, that, that would be my preference most of the time. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it, um, I don't get a chance to see everything in person. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's great when I'm already familiar with the artist, so I understand the materials that, they, that they're working with. And, and sort of, uh, I might un understand the painting um, or the work from a previous work that I might've seen before. Right. So that makes it easier. But there's times where, you know, I'll fall in love with a PDF and right. it'll show up and look better in person. Right. And then it's probably been two times when I got a piece and I'm like, uh, it's not as good as I, as I thought it was gonna be. Yeah. And, um, and, th and that's happened twice out of all of the work that, 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 that I've purchased. 
Well, you've been, that's, that's, I think that's, that's a very low percentage. Mm -hmm. So, so that, so you got a good eye. I'm going to have Michael bring up two images and then we're going to close it out. Michael, can you bring up the, um, a molten, um, Boafos piece and Derek's piece, please. And, um, I just want to talk about somebody talking about, um, the emerging artist, the, uh, white hat, white shade, um, this is a piece, this is an artist that is in demand and very hard to get. How would you say people go about a collecting artists that um, getting on these lists? Because I know there's a long, long list. I, I, I think you have to invest, you, you have to invest in the, in, the, in the relationship. And to be honest with you, where, when, when, he, when he had his show at Roberts in LA, um, I was away. I was on the East Coast. So I didn't, so I wasn't able to make it to the show and I didn't have a relationship with, with, with Roberts and I missed it. And Jeffrey Deitch had the punch show in LA and I, I made it to the show. I think it was the last day. And I saw, I saw, I saw a piece and I'm like, oh my God, who is this artist? And, but the piece was already sold. So Jeffrey said, hold on, I'm going to call over to Roberts and I'll see because there may be one left from the old show. And Jeffrey was able to locate this for me. Okay. And, um, but, you know, I think I, I was, I was able to, I was able to get it because of, you know, the relation, investing in that relationship, you know, with, with Jeffrey and then, but, but, but also, I think what they they knew, you know, I think that the the something from the same show flipped that auction, you know what I'm saying, or that same time period flipped that flipped that auction, and but they, you know, I think they understood that that wasn't the intent. Okay, okay, and Derek, I had to fight for this piece. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. They didn't. They said, uh, "We'll see. We're, we're taking we're taking interest right now." And Derek, I have been collecting for probably six years before I even bought this piece. And, um, and, and I made a big stink and called Aaron from the hammer and a bunch of other people. And I'm like, can you believe this day? Da, da, da. And, um, and they ended up selling it. And it's one of my favorite pieces. And Derek is, I love, love him dearly. And just one of my favorite people, by the way. Yeah. I, I actually was, um, down and saw this in the show at, at night gallery. This is the only one I wanted, by the way. Only one you wanted. Only one I wanted. And like I love the show, but when yeah. I when I saw that piece, yeah, and you know, the, and I, it's it it was you know, do you, do you want to choose a few? Nope, <laughs> just the, just the, just the one. So this is when you use your power, your connections, I right? Think they, I think they might have gotten sick of hearing from me, and and. <laughs> Well, well, listen, thank you. Um, Michael, you can take it down. Thank you so much, um, oh, you, Roy. D is there any final comments you'd like to make? No, just uh, thanks for this forum, by the way. And just for, you know, for being, I looked at the names in the, in the, in the chat and, um, and the participants. And just thanks, thanks for even creating this forum for us right now. I think with everything going on in the world right now, and, you know, this, this, this is just a good, um, release valve, just being able to have a, a, this sort of creative conversation as well. You're welcome. And I want to wish you happy Father's Day. Oh, thank you. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy your time in Martha's Vineyard. Thank you. And um, we'll be in touch. So thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.